This week, Conflict Zone is in Brussels, and my guest is the Russian ambassador to the EU, Vladimir Chizhov. Not the easiest job at the best of times, and these are hardly the best of times. His sole function seems to be to deny NATO's accusations of aggression and throw them back at the West. So how believable is he? Vladimir Chizhov, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. You don't need me to tell you that it's a bad time for East-West diplomacy, that neither side believes a word of what the other is saying. So what are your instructions from Moscow? Keep denying and wait till better times? I wouldn't say it's a bad time for diplomacy. I would rather put it as a challenging time for diplomacy. Because... That's very diplomatic of you. Well, that's it's part. a bad time. I mean, relations are very fraught. Let's, it's, let's it's just a bad, accept that. It's a bad period, um, a difficult period in the relationship, but it's a challenging time for diplomacy because diplomacy is a tool to straighten things out. Given that it is this difficult time, you gave an interview last month to a Western interviewer. And, uh, did you, I? Yes, you did your own bit of denial. You said there's no evidence that Russia has made any aggressive moves in Ukraine or against Ukraine. There was no invasion of Crimea. Indeed. Who on earth do you expect to believe that? Well, if you look objectively at the figures and at the legal basis for what uh, Russia did and what Russia did not do uh, regarding Crimea, well, the Russians... You seem to have forgotten this avalanche of condemnation that you got at the United Nations two years ago, basically, when the world turned down your idea of... I, I wouldn't uh, say... Crimea inside Russia, didn't they? Canada condemned the Russian Federation's unilateral and unjustified assault on Ukraine. Well, a country, Japan, a country... European uh, Union. Yeah, a country that has uh, such a sizable uh, Ukrainian... Uh, community as Canada, uh, well, perhaps that explains it. Yeah, but they didn't know. There were 100 countries who adopted a resolution basically declaring illegal the March 16th referendum that uh, changed the status of Crimea as far as you were concerned. 100 countries. They didn't yes. all have sizable Ukrainian populations. No, there. indeed. But the 100 countries uh, are a very small majority of the UN member states to begin with. Well, you've got 11 voting with you, let's be honest. 100 against 11. I know there were 58 abstentions, but you only managed to get 11. So Moscow can't have been exactly thrilled with your diplomacy at the United Nations. Well, I would say that uh, in this particular case, uh, it's not so much the numbers at the UN that matter, but the numbers uh, uh, the percentage of people who voted in the Crimean referendum. And when I say that uh, allegations of Russian invasion of Crimea are totally wrong, I can refer to the fact that there was a Russian naval base in Crimea since the 18th century, all along. Uh, and How far do you want to go back in history to say that things were different? <laughs> no, I would, you want to go back? I would say that, uh, of course, uh, the population of Crimea uh, was uh, more than two-thirds ethnically Russian. And uh, if we refer to the language aspect of the situation, uh, only 3% of, uh, of the Crimean population uh, declared their mother tongue Ukrainian. Mr. Chizhov, Which was actually less than those who declared uh, the Crimean Tatar language as their mother tongue. But Mr. Chizhov, this referendum took place in a Crimea that was already under armed Russian occupation. Foreign guns were pointing at the people. That's a wonderful recipe for what your president called an open, honest and dignified referendum, is it? I wonder how dignified a referendum would be in Moscow, for instance, if you had American guns pointing at you while you voted. Well, actually, the, uh, again, I referred to 
the legitimacy of Russian military presence in Crimea in those days. Uh, according to the Russian-Ukrainian bilateral treaty of 1997, uh, Russia uh, had uh, the right uh, for, for military presence both in Sevastopol, which is the uh, major naval base, but also across Crimea at the level of 25,000 military personnel. The actual numbers uh, when the, the crisis erupted were 16,000, much less than the 25. The remaining gap of 9,000 was filled quickly, yes, by uh, sending uh, additional reinforcements by uh, plane. Despite uh, the fact that your let president... Me, let me finish. No, despite let the me, fact that your finish. president said that the people who took over the buildings were, in his words, spontaneous self-defense forces. Right Spontaneous. So. Yeah, but the story changed a month later on April the 17th, 2014, when he said, of course the Russian servicemen did back the Crimean self-defense forces, something he'd omitted to say earlier. They acted in a civil, a decisive and professional manner. This was your first complete change of story without even a blush, I wouldn't say, wasn't it? I wouldn't say it was a change of story. Actually, this was confirmation of the actual role the Russian military played, which was to provide safe and secure environment for, uh, for the referendum and the expression of political will by the local population. Let's, let's be honest here. Your president was asked who these people were, these little green men who were in uniforms. Where did they get these uniforms? And he said, shops, shops. That was his reply. We know because retired Russian Admiral Igor Kasatonov um, spoke out in 2015 that these so-called green men were Russian Spetsnaz special forces. There were six helicopter landings from them and three IL-76 Russian transport planes that brought in 500 of them. So when your president said March 4th that these people were simply spontaneous self-defense forces, he was being economical with the truth, wasn't he? Well, I think he uh, actually meant uh, different people, those who were actively involved in the changeover in Crimea. These are semantics, aren't they? These are semantics. He basically said that it's all locals and then the story changed <laughs> and you'd flown in 500 Spetsnaz forces. We've flown, that's that's we, the reality, isn't it? That's we, the reality. And then they crowed, crowed, crowed about having fooled NATO. Kasatonov said, well, NATO didn't even spot them coming in. What a triumph it was for us. <laughs> so, you know, he boasted about it. But you'd misled think, us by then. So I, why should we believe anything that you say now? You misled us on this. I think uh, the important uh, part of this um, situation was that uh, the Russian troops who were there actually didn't fire a shot. The, uh, there was no uh, actual fighting, in spite that uh, the Ukrainian military presence in, in Crimea in those days was at the level of 20,000, some of the best Ukrainian troops. Uh, so there was no military clash. There was no armed confrontation. Uh, and you that disarmed them. You disarmed them. Of course, that, that's not a military confrontation when you go in and demand that they put down their arms. A foreign force arrives, helicopters and IL-76 plane demands that they drop their arms. That's not a military confrontation. I don't know what is. I think if the Americans arrived in Moscow and did it to your forces, I think you'd call that a military well, or, confrontation. Well, Russians you? arrive in Washington, D.C. Exactly. <laughs> that would be a military confrontation. So, so you're arguing over semantics here. The other, the other story that changed a lot was the story about your troops being in eastern Ukraine. I mean, for almost two years, we heard denials that Russian servicemen were involved in eastern Ukraine. And then, magically, on December the 17th last year, Mr. Putin changes the story. We never said that there weren't people dealing with certain tasks in the military sphere, but that doesn't mean there are regular Russian forces there. Feel the difference, he said. Contrast that with what he said eight months earlier. I will say this clearly, there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. Different story, different story. Again, you mislead us. Well, you started 
by asking me about diplomacy. The role of diplomacy is slightly different. And how, when you mislead the other side, how, how can diplomacy work to this extent? Well, diplomacy should uh, take cons into consideration uh, the objective situation, uh, the realities on the ground, and look for ways to settle this crisis or any crisis across the globe uh, by diplomatic means, through political dialogue. But and when your reality is so different from the reality as seen by the 100 countries who voted against your referendum at the United Nations, what, what, what is there to talk about? Well, that, uh, that uh, I think, uh, the reality, as we all see today, uh, is, uh, some, is, is an objective picture. Uh, we may disagree on the uh, explanations of the course of events, be it two years ago, be it 20 years ago, be it 100 years ago. But uh, the reality on the ground that we're facing uh, should be the basis for, uh, to, for people, uh, including pol pol politicians and uh, state leaders, to look forward but, rather but than backwards. But it's very difficult to do that when you continue to deny, and you have done over the last two years, that you've had troops in eastern Ukraine, even when some of them have actually been caught by the other side. I mean, two examples. Captain Yevgeny Yerafiev and Sergeant Alexander Alexandrov both identified themselves as serving members of your GRU Special Forces taken prisoner in eastern Ukraine in May 2015. In December 2015, Mr. Putin was asked about them. He made no effort to disown them. Instead, he called for a calm discussion about them and what he called an equal prisoner exchange. So you wanted to exchange your proper Russian forces in eastern Ukraine with some Ukrainians that have been captured. Your forces were there. Everybody knows your forces were there. Why for two years did we have this deception that your forces weren't in eastern Ukraine? I mean, we even had, NATO even put out satellite pictures. Look, there's a satellite picture. 21st of August, commercial satellite picture. It's showing, a commercial satellite show, show, picture. Yes, showing, ah. your, showing your forces within the sovereign territory well, of that, Ukraine. Well, that doesn't prove that these self-propelled artillery pieces belong to the Russian army. No, but they were in a position where the Ukrainian army wasn't. So there is high probability that they belong to your forces. Or, but I mean, or they could, be, uh, could belong to the forces of the self-proclaimed Donetsk or Lugansk Republic. But we have so many Russian sources now that have told us over the last couple of years. I mean, e even the Committee of Soldiers' Mothers, Valentina Melnikova, who is a member of your Defense Ministry's Public Council, she said that up to 15,000 Russian troops have been sent to Ukraine in August and September 2014. She's, head of, she's a member of your Russian Defense Ministry's Public Council. She's not speaking nonsense. Well, she? everybody has the right to make a, a, <laughs> a wrong judgment or a mistake. So. What about Ilya Yashin, who co-authored with the murdered opposition leader Boris Nemtsov the report Putin War? He talked of how 220 Russians were lost in East, two major battles in eastern Ukraine in August 2014 and February 2015. He said all the key successes of the separatists were secured by Russian army units. Plenty of sources. Well, that's, his, po Russia. that's his point of view. Mine is different. So who's true? I mean, you have the weight of evidence points and, and the numbers of Russian soldiers that have been apprehended there, some, of course. You they, referred to two. Well, I referred to two, but there were others. <laughs> but who, they were, there they, were others who said they, they lost their way. They somehow lost their way yeah. because maps, that, maps are so difficult to come by these days, <laughs> aren't they? Reliable maps. It's so hard to get And them, those two that it? you referred to, uh, the, uh, at the time when they uh, were apprehended, in eastern Ukraine, they were not on active duty. They weren't? Yes. So that's, an, that's another semantic issue, isn't it? Well, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to prove uh, uh, things with evidence that gets lost and uh, a lawyer for one of those two gets uh, killed in Ukraine. But, you know, the OSCE, I mean, you're a member of the OSCE, yes, sure. Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. I mean, they continue to condemn your actions in Ukraine. Last summer, 
the Parliamentary Assembly, talked of your unilateral and unjustified assault on Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. My point, Mr. Ambassador, is that people aren't buying your version, are they? They're well, just simply not uh, buying it. That's uh, 96 votes in favor oh. of a resolution against you, seven against. 96 votes. That's uh, probably the result of uh, an information war uh, launched uh, against Russia and uh, which is continuing to this day. You don't fight in information wars either? Uh, we have to respond, yes. Yeah. We do, we are engaged in that, which is a new element, uh, of course, uh, uh, in this 21st century of ours. But your policy is never admit a mistake, never say sorry. Russia is always perfect. Uh, well, that's not so. No? Uh, Nobody is perfect. No, no, so but it's all the other side's fault? Uh, not always. Uh, there are mistakes. I think one of the, if we look back uh, to the post-Soviet period, I think one of the mistakes uh, the, uh, Russia did, the Russian leadership of the time did, was to, to trust too much uh, its Western partners. You're talking about Mr. Gorbachev, right? Eh? Oh, uh, and his su immediate successor. You actually talked about this, didn't you, in September 2014. You said in an interview that NATO had promised it wouldn't expand eastwards and that mm -hmm. Mikhail Gorbachev had been naive enough to believe those promises. Yes. But perhaps you should have checked with Mr. Gorbachev himself before you'd said that, because perhaps he knows a little bit more about the situation after he was there, because a month after you gave that interview, he was asked by Russia beyond the headlines, whether the West had lied about its plans for Eastern Europe. And he said, the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. I say this with full responsibility. Not a single Eastern European country raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. Western leaders didn't bring it up either. So, that's his answer to your accusation of promises well, being broken. Well, it doesn't contradict to what I said. Uh, well, where are the promises? Because Gorbachev <laughs> added the agreement on a final settlement with Germany said that mm -hmm. no new military structures would be created in the eastern part of the country. No additional troops would be deployed. No weapons of mass destruction would mm -hmm. be placed there. Gorbachev said it has been observed all these years. Gorbachev said this was observed. No, he didn't say that NATO had broken its promises. He said it's been observed all these years. This is, this is, in, your, this is in your journal, Russia Beyond the Headlines. Well, <laughs> Produced by Rasiska <laughs> Gazeta. Yes. Uh, How do well, you explain that? Uh, with all due respect to my former leader, mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, certain promises made orally during uh, his and other discussions uh, of those days in the last... Did you think he the, didn't know about it? Well, uh, of course he knew, but in the sense that... Uh, the so why issue, would he lie the, about the, it? Issue, the issue of NATO expansion may, uh, may not have been uh, a formal subject of, of negotiations because uh, I believe that uh, this issue uh, was not perceived in those days as realistic by the Soviet side of the time. But, but you, you want to discuss history? Well, well you brought it up. <laughs> I mean, you said, you, you said this was a mistake that Russia made in believing the promises. And I'm telling you that the last leader of the Soviet Union said there weren't any promises that were broken. But I mean, let's stay, well, let's stay with now. I can assure you there were. OK, because you continue to complain about efforts to, to humiliate Russia to politically and militarily contain Russia, but there's no evidence of external humiliation of Russia, is there? I mean, after the USSR collapsed, what happened? Russia was welcome to the Council of Europe, was welcome to the World Trade Organization, closer relations with the EU. How humiliating was all that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not complaining. Second, you referred to, to the WTO. I wouldn't say that Russia was particularly welcomed into the WTO. It took 18 years of tough negotiations to get in. And now we are asking ourselves whether, ourselves whether it was worth the while. 
But that's with, a with, with that's, TTP that's a and TTIP that's a different calculation. coming up, which uh, may result uh, in uh, you know the future of the WTO being put into question. You were welcome to the NATO Russia Council, which was set up specifically. It was, you were promised that as long as you respected borders in Europe, no substantial combat forces would be moved east. No nuclear installations have been moved onto the territory of new NATO members, have they? And in response to Russian objections, Ukraine and Georgia were denied NATO membership in 2008. I don't see much very humiliating about that, do you, to Russia? Well, uh, I wouldn't say they were denied entry. Actually, the Bucharest summit uh, of NATO uh, produced a docu final document which uh, stipulates that those two countries will be NATO members. Yeah, but they weren't. They wanted it then and there in 2008. And as you know, George W. Bush said no. No, it's not going to happen. President Obama went even further. He changed the configuration of the proposed missile defense installation in Poland, suspended its phase four because Moscow didn't like it. Is that humiliating too? Well, these, uh, these issues mm. were, uh, were for many years uh, the subject of very... Um, heated, I would say, discussions, but very professional discussions with our Western partners. But recent developments, is, since you refer to missile defense, I, I uh, can say that uh, the recent developments, which uh, actually uh, mean that phase two of the global anti-ABM uh, system of the United States is being completed with the launch of a, a base in Romania, that was yesterday, you say the launch of a base. This is a missile, you know, this you know is a missile defense installation. Indeed. As you know, aimed at Iran. Uh, what is the purpose, I would say? Uh, Iran... Well, I don't speak for the Americans, but the Americans says it's to deter an attack from Iran. Uh, when Iran doesn't have the means to, uh, to reach uh, either Romania or any other European country. The Americans would dispute that, wouldn't they? Uh, well, they can dispute that, but it's a fact, uh, a fact recognized by everybody that uh, the longest range of Iranian missiles is below 2,000 kilometers. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the international effort by my country, other uh, Western countries, uh, and the uh, European Union has produced a comprehensive plan to to resolve the problem of the Iranian nuclear program. So uh, why, why, would, why would NATO or the, Amer or the United States see Iran as a, as a menace? As well, a you'd have to ask them, but you talk about your contribution. In the period, let's talk about the threat that NATO feels that you pose. Between 2013 and 2015, your air activity close to NATO's European airspace has increased by about 70%. Allied aircraft scrambled 400 times in that period to intercept your plane. And they say you indulge in highly dangerous behavior. Often you file no flight plan, you don't talk to air traffic controllers, and you switch off your transponders and endangering civilian aircraft. Why would you do something like that? Why would you put civilian aircraft in danger unnecessarily? Well, you refer to certain figures. I would say that... Uh Air, uh, air, military air activity of NATO in the same area it, it, during the same period increased fourfold. And uh, NATO uh, military planes fly around with their transponders uh, shut off. Well, that's, I'm asking you why you fly with yours off. Because, that's, because that's, there was an incident in January last year where your ambassador in London was summoned to the Foreign Office to explain why civilian aircraft had to be rerouted because your bombers were flying up the channel and disrupting air activity. I will, uh, my answer is quite simple. Uh, it's usual practice by uh, air forces of all countries including Russia, including NATO countries, to fly without uh, transporter, with the transporters shut off. That's, that's the usual practice. And to fly, and, and and to fly 100 feet above, uh, above uh, an American warship in the uh, Baltic last month, yes, US, uh, US uh, warship, uh, USS warship Donald had, Cook. Yes, a warship armed with cruise missiles 
and uh, directed against the Russian naval base in Kaliningrad. Well, they didn't fire and they didn't target it, did they? But this no. was in direct violation of the 1972 agreement on the prevention of incidents on and over the high seas, where aircraft commanders are required to use the greatest caution in approaching aircraft and ships of the other party. Not Which they did. Not fly Which they 100 did. feet above them. That's great caution, <laughs> is it? Of course. It's, it's a sign of high professionalism of Russian pilots. Ambassador Chizhev, it's been good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>